and when he was in different countries, he got to different bars and clubs, and um, he quickly realised that his favourite sort of clubs to go to uh, were BDSM bars and sort of uh, sadomasochistic bars, uh, and he realised he really liked uh, the sort of the hardcore stuff, like the real oh, fucking deep shit, okay. um, and he was always uh, playing the more dominant role. So right. he was always the more dominant one in the whole situation. Um, he left the Italian commando unit in 1975, and he moved to good old Britannia, rule Britannia. Um, he found uh, work as a hairdresser, uh, and he worked in the Yves Saint Laurent. Say that right? Yves Saint Laurent? As in the big, massive brand, Yves Saint Laurent. Yeah, the big, massive brand, Yves Saint Laurent. Hairdressing? Yeah. I don't know if Saint Laurent was a hairdressing. It seems like uh, in big cities and shit, they have like salons and boutiques and things, maybe. Oh. Uh, so he worked in the salon, in the Yves Saint Laurent salon. <gasps> Ooh, that sounds fun on the tongue. <laughs> Yves Saint Laurent salon. Uh, he worked in the Yves Saint Laurent salon <laughs> in London. Um, and when he saved up enough money from working in there, uh, he managed to actually open up his own boutique, his own place. Okay. Uh, couldn't find the name of uh, what it was called, unfortunately. I tried to find it. I really want to know what it was called. That probably went down El Guac. Quack. 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 What, Quack. his own Quack. boutique? Yeah. Uh, surprisingly not. Surprisingly the oh. complete freaking opposite of it. Um, he changed his name to Nicky Clark. And, no, he didn't. <laughs> he did, shit. Did you, did, you, did you shit a brick then <laughs> for, like for a second? For a split second, yeah. I was like, no, oh no, my no, no, no. I'm not God. bragging you. I'm not pranking you anymore. Um, he opened up his own boutique. Uh, the store catered to a special range of clients. Uh, eventually the place got a reputation within the local gay community. So this is why the place was so freaking success, uh, successful. Um, he His sort of clientele was the wealthy uh, and sort of high society guys who wanted to lay low. So, okay. you know, like the in, in the closet kind of guys. Yeah. Um, but the, because they were very um, rich and very wealthy, um, they would go to his place because they felt like it was a safe space. Which makes sense. Understandable. Understandable yeah. for the time. Um, it's kind of like um, when we watched... The movie Milk, when they all went to the Castro. Yeah. Kind of like yeah. that. Yeah, when they all yeah. just go to one place and then they do that. But um, the Castro, I think, was more for like the, um, like the, I don't like the word down and outs, but I think I think of down and outs as like cool people, like like the the hipsters, like the cool kids. The, like the, the people who've got nowhere to The go. ones who people wouldn't give jobs to because yeah. they're gay and all that sort of fucking bullshit. And that's where they would go. This is like the people who are wealthy, who are well-known people. Uh, and they just want to keep their love life a uh, little secret. Yep. Um, so because of that particular type of clientele, uh, Michael was able to charge a little extra for his services. Um, so, of course, they would pay a little bit more to go to his place than what they would. They were more than happy to do that. Yeah. C- compared to going to like a normal barbershop or something. Um they would pay handsomely for his products and, tre- and treatments, uh, affording Michael the ability to live rather extravagantly and comfortably. Michael referred to it as a styling boutique. Now, I don't know if that's the actual name of the place or if that's just what he referred to it as. That's the only thing closest to a kind of name of it, like a vibe. Uh, but styling boutique is a pretty uncreative name for a hairdresser, right? Is it actually hairdressers or, like, makeup and clothing and stuff? I think he did a few different things. I don't think he did clothing. But I think he, he was a hairdresser, and I think um, he would just do a different a few different things. I yeah. Think, I think that was the, that was the deal. Okay. Um, I also don't know if there was, like, a little bit of... Um, um, you know, a little... Um, Go on as well. It's like that ASMR. <laughs> ASMR. Uh, bum flap noise? Is that what it was? I don't know what that fucking was. Bum flap? Foskin flap. Foskin flap. Oh, yes. Shit. Fuck. <laughs> Foskin flap. Um, uh, <laughs> fuck, where have we? Where It's been a long fucking week. Um, so, yeah, um, they attracted a lot of uh, attractive guys. A lot of attractive guys. Uh, most of them were obsessed with their own appearance. Uh, and Michael, still being the promiscuous little devil uh, he was, found his little shop a little paradise for meeting men. So, um, I don't know if some of these were paying for any sort of extra... Extra services. Uh, but he was definitely uh, getting strong, uh, one way or another. Okay. Uh, the place actually became so successful that the Mike was eventually able to move to a, get this, a £300,000 home 
in Roland Gardens in South Kensington. And what year was this? Uh, 1986. Wow. It's a lot, a lot of money, right? Um, so he's Probably like... nearly a mil, right? Yeah, I'm guessing so. In this, in today's yeah, money? Yeah, in today's money. Yeah, yeah, probably. Shit. He's doing well for himself. Uh, the huge place uh, that he bought would serve well for his future indulgences uh, as he designed and built himself a torture chamber to execute his sexual plans. So, like kind of like Fifty Shades of Grey's Red Dungeon. Or yeah, Red Dream, or like, that, was. like that. Even though I've never seen that movie, I've seen the trailer. Never I've seen read the, the book. trailer. No. And I've heard everybody talk about the book. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> uh, one, like sometimes you got those bars in um, Manchester Eagle. Yeah. <laughs> and you got a little dark room thing where everyone got. <laughs> uh, well, but then I, I'm, I'm assuming with if he's able to fucking put three hundred thousand pounds into a home, he might have some elaborate shit going on there. Probably. Like I'm trying to think of what you could put in. Like electrodes, slings, slings. Well, everyone's got a sling, right? Well, I was downstairs. So. <laughs> we don't have a sling. <laughs> we don't have a sling. Uh, uh, yes, anyway, uh, we digress. Um, Michael's usual weeknight routine would involve uh, finishing work, uh, going to a few uh, BDSM bars, uh, finding, in a du- uh, finding a dude, uh, which was usually anyone with uh, a pretty face to him, uh, and then bringing them back to his underground sort of sex chamber. By the way, I'm not trying to... I don't. I'm always so aware of like the tone of that I'm using when I'm talking about certain things because I really don't want to sound like I'm like shaming anyone or being making fun of something. Like if you want to fucking go and do this shit, do this shit. Like go for it. You know what I mean? Does does that even come across? Do I sound like I'm taking the piss? Um, People say sometimes I'm sounding like taking the piss. I don't think you do, but you know me though. I I know you, so I. I don't think you are. To anyone out there, sometimes I do sound like I'm taking the piss out of certain things when I'm actually genuinely not. It's just like the inflections in my voice that I use and stuff. Sometimes it just sounds weird. But no, if you want to get in kinky shit, get in fucking kinky shit. You do you. As long um, as it's consented. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that should... How weird is it that we should say that? That should be like something you don't have to say. Consensual sex is the only sex. Otherwise, it's rape. Yep. Uh, uh, so yeah, I found um, a message uh, from a woman on a forum. Uh, this is how much fucking research I did uh, to do this. Uh, so I found a message uh, from a woman on a forum who says she actually knew Michael around this particular time, Ooh. which is interesting to me. Um, I'll read it uh, sort of quote for quote, and then we'll move on to his uh, story. Uh, so she says here that um, I was friends with him in the eighties. Uh, he and I would have breakfast together in the Oreo Bar on in Sloan Square. Uh, or meet in Knightsbridge for lunch. I nearly rented his flat from him in Roland Gardens uh, with my then boyfriend. However, I realised that Michael was just interested in hitting on my boyfriend. Uh, At the time, I thought it was funny. He really changed personality when he started to frequent a club called Skin 2 in London. Uh, He became more verbally vicious and bitchy. Hmm. I just thought, like, it's an interesting insight into someone... Cause, because I couldn't yeah. find too much information on him from, like, uh, like factual things, like, like story-wise. Uh, I, I just thought it was interesting to maybe add a little note there from someone who says they actually know him. But at the same time, we need to take it with a grain of salt. It might not actually be real at all. No, of course. But I did look into this a little bit. So I wanted to sort of maybe try and fact check a little bit of what she was saying just to see how uh, close it could be. And Skin 2 actually is a legitimate place that was in London. Um, it was... Is that I, When I looked at it now, I think it's a magazine now for like um, BDSM and like leather and shit. Oh, really? Yeah, it's like Skin 2 uh, was a bar in London. Uh, well, it was, it was a night in London. Uh, and then there's also got Skin 2 Germany as well, which has got another one. Uh, Skin 2 as well is allegedly the same club uh, that Ol- that Colin Island would uh, attend later on in 1993. Remember Colin Island? That piece of shit. No. No. Oh, you fucker! Your memory's so bad. How can you remember Colin Island? My memory... You know what my memory's like. My He's memory's- the one who d- died this year. Remember? He had the glasses. Well, they all have the glasses. I was going to say, that that's not narrowing it down at all. He had the glasses. He was like the <laughs> British Jeffrey Dahmer, what were you saying? Remember? Oh. And he had the different flats and he moved and then buried on his Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What he found the, like the, in the drain. In the drain. Yes, yeah, yeah. there we go. The penny has dropped. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so that too. <laughs> so apparently this bar was a place where he would go as well. Um, right, okay. I did find uh, another article about Skin 2. Uh, and apparently... Uh, 
this is all trying to paint the scene of like the area and the lifestyle he was leading and what he was like, like as well. Um, I did find an article about Skin Suit and apparently it was kind of uh, an important place within that particular sort of scene, you know, like BDSM leather shit. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, one of, if not the first place like it in the UK. Uh, there was this, uh, a journalist who, who wrote that uh, about the BDSM scene within the UK that... Um, it began with uh, just a handful of people in the small dingy Soho club called Skin 2, uh, which resided in what was, for the rest of the week, a gay club called Stallions. So it sounds like this Skin 2 place was um, it's a built from the ground up, so I think. Yeah, and it seems like it sort of uh, was the first UK point for uh, sort of the people who are into sort of BDSM, leather and shit. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Um, it was apparently um, opened up by a guy called David Claridge, who, uh, strangely enough, was the puppeteer behind... Do you ever remember uh, Roland the Rat from the kids' TV? No. I think he's slightly before our time, uh, but he was like a little rat. I think he was on BBC and shit. But yeah, the guy who fucking... Wait, is that one of Philip Schofield? Oh, no, that uh, was Gopher, wasn't that it? That was Gordon the Gopher, but yeah. Gordon the Gopher was like a parody of Roland the Rat. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the place doesn't sound the greatest, though, as well. Apparently the whole place was quite clicky, um, and they were very much sort of like, um, you're in here and you're part of this community, or you're out. not, or you're out. Uh, apparently uh, one guy said that he was threatened with physical violence in Skin 2 several times. Uh, one guy seized him by the neck, um, because wow. he was like a new person. Mm-hmm. Which I get, you'd be very protective, especially if you're into something which is, uh, you know, one, you're gay, and two, you're into something which... A lot of people see it as sort of uh, outside of the norm or whatever like that. Yeah. And they see it as like a freaky diggy thing. Um, and, it, you know, you don't want fucking weird old bizarre journalists walking in and starting to just rat on you and shit. So yeah. maybe I can understand it. Definitely. Uh, Michael loved it. <laughs> he fucking loved the place. Um, and it was known that he would go there and boast that um, he had, over his lifetime, he had had uh, sex with over 4,000 men. It's a lot Is of cock, right? Is that even possible? 4,000 men. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's possible, right? So he'd be having to have um, sex pretty much every day. Uh, which, um, actually, uh, from the information we've got, he kind of did. <laughs> so it's not uh, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, yeah, uh, apparently he had sex with over 4,000 men, uh, but he was always very careless. And by careless, I mean he didn't use protection. Yeah. Uh, and he would literally take anyone he could get. So he wasn't checking anyone he wasn't doing anything crazy and like i mentioned at the start with the opener uh this is um sort of in the in the middle it's it's just five years after sort of the crisis of hiv was was sort of declared and people's game came out so you think you'd be super cautious right you would think so i mean you should be cautious even nowadays but back then the the, the sort of the fear and the the fact that it was so predominant in other mainstream yeah. media that you you would think that but you know you, you can't blame people because there's people out there who weren't well, that's true, yeah. like overly promiscuous and shit. And all that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to offend anyone. Um, so yeah, apparently there wouldn't be a single night that went by uh, without Michael taking someone home. Michael's dates would often leave his home uh, with bruises, uh, incisions, uh, bloody noses, uh, and strangle marks around their necks. So uh, it's pretty hardcore shit that these guys are into. Um, it's a, whether they uh, 100% enjoyed um, everything that went on within the uh, is unknown because you know you wouldn't fucking know. Yeah, uh, they weren't fucking blogging about it or anything back then, so I don't know. But I'm, I'm assuming if they didn't want it, they probably would have gone to the police. No, they wouldn't have gone to the police. Not in fucking 1986, they wouldn't. No. Um, in March 1986, uh, after years uh, of uh, promiscuity and unprotected sex, uh, Michael Lupo was diagnosed with HIV. Uh, which, uh, of course, for a lot of people would change things. Uh, for Michael, though, uh, he went on as he had always done. Oh. Kind of. Oh. Uh, Michael's diagnosis brought him a lot of anger, uh, but not to him. He wasn't sort of angry at himself for being careless. He wasn't like, oh, why didn't I do that? Or I'm so angry at myself for not doing this. Um, his anger was aimed outwards at so, everybody else. Okay. Everybody else. Uh, and it, in, it brought out uh, a monster inside of him. Uh, you can probably see where this is headed now, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, we've um, 
you know, there are examples of people even to this day, which is fucking sick, of people who purposely try and infect people with HIV and get bitter, you know, about their own diagnosis and things. That's just twisted. Like, those people who won't go on forums and then they brag about um, how they have uh, infected someone. Pricked condoms. Pricked condoms.